How does Moses make his coffee? How? He brews it. <laughs> Do you have another joke, Rip? Yes. Knock, knock. Who's there? Anita. Anita who? I need to borrow a Bible. <laughs> You're funny. <laughs> That's a good one. Why didn't the skeleton cross the road? Why didn't he? Because he didn't have the guts to. <gasps>《Our scripture reading today is from Acts 9, 1 through 19, the conversion of Saul. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Sell, sell, why do you prosecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice, but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has been in a vision. A man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to our saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, go for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and Kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house he laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on your way here has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. For the past few weeks, we've been talking about encounters with Jesus on the road, something that happens often in the New Testament and also functions as a metaphor for our own spiritual journeys through life, the different ways in which Jesus meets us where we are transforms our way of seeing the world, and often sends us in an entirely new direction. That's exactly what happens in today's scripture passage, where a man named Saul is traveling to Damascus with thoughts of murder in his heart and a legal warrant to find Christians there, apprehend them, and bring them back to Jerusalem on charges of heresy. But instead, Jesus finds Saul. And in a blinding blaze of light, asks him, why are you persecuting me? This dramatic encounter leads to a change of heart for Saul, a change of purpose, and eventually a change of name. After this, he will be known as the Apostle Paul, the one who brought the gospel message to people all over the Mediterranean lands. 
Now, this is without a doubt the most famous conversion story in the Bible and possibly the most famous on-the-road story in all literature, not just the Bible. Because of this, it has been portrayed in great works of art throughout the centuries. I want to take advantage of that fact and also of this online medium to do something a little different today and actually look at some of those representations in art and how one story can be told in so many different ways. While depictions of this story in art span all the way from the earliest days of Christianity right up to the present day, I want to zoom in on the centuries of the Renaissance and the Reformation in Europe. That was a period of great artistic and spiritual renewal, and it was also the period that gave birth to our movement, the Presbyterian movement. We'll begin with the great Italian painter Michelangelo. This piece by Michelangelo is titled The Conversion of Saul and was completed in 1545. It's a fresco, which is a type of mural painting on plaster walls. This particular fresco is painted on the wall of the Pauline Chapel in the Vatican Palace. Now, the first thing we notice is that there's a lot going on in this painting, a lot of people and a lot of chaos which perhaps tells us something about the artist's understanding of what a conversion experience is like. Notice that there's a sharp division between all the people, Jesus and the saints above, and Paul and all the sinners below. And right near the middle of the painting, there's also a horse, which is something of a mystery, since there is no horse in the actual scripture passage, but just about every depiction of this scene in artwork from the 13th century onward always features a horse. In the scripture passage from Acts, we read that a light flashed from heaven, and you can see that light in this painting, almost like a thunderbolt flashing straight down from Jesus, who looks kind of angry, directly to Paul. In verse 7, we read that those who were traveling with Paul heard the voice, but saw no one. Or in the original Greek, they saw medena, no thing. They saw nothing. In all the pieces we'll look at today, I want you to pay close attention to who hears and who sees. In this painting, almost everyone is looking up to heaven and like Paul, several are shielding their eyes from the light, so clearly they see something. But the most fascinating thing about this painting is actually the face of Paul himself. Paul in this painting is an old man with a white beard. Now, Michelangelo, just like anyone who reads the story carefully, probably knew that Paul was a young man in this scene at the beginning of his career. And so the face of Paul in this painting is actually a self-portrait. Michelangelo, nearing the end of his life and his career and experiencing a great renewal in his own faith, painted himself right into the picture. That's something I believe the scriptures and the great stories of the Bible are constantly calling all of us to do as well. The next painting is one of my favorites. It's titled The Conversion of Paul by Peter Bruegel the Elder, a Flemish painter who was a contemporary of the reformers Martin Luther and John Calvin and lived in the same part of Europe as they did. Bruegel is known for his depictions of peasants and common scenes of everyday life. In fact, he was nicknamed the peasant painter. Now this painting is still busy with lots of people but there's actually not a lot of commotion or chaos. Note the long and winding road that runs throughout the painting. Everyone is on a journey. Unlike Michelangelo, who puts his subjects in ancient-looking costumes, Bruegel's subjects are dressed in the costumes of Bruegel's own century, which is another attempt to put the viewer into the story. And those mountains that the characters are crossing, those are the Alps, not anything anywhere near Jerusalem or Damascus. 
Now, at first glance, you might be asking yourself, okay, so where is Paul in this painting? And that's on purpose, too. It's actually a technique from the Mannerist school of painting that draws you into the picture, forcing you to see other things and other people on your way to the main subject. Have you found Paul yet? Look for the obligatory horse near the middle, the one that is lying down. What's fascinating about this painting is that there's no Jesus, no flashing light, and the people around Paul seem more interested in what's happening to him than what's happening up in the heavens. A few of them are looking up, but not many. And that makes sense too, since according to the scriptures, only Paul sees the light. Most people just go about their business, carrying on with their lives and journeys, perhaps waiting for their own conversion experiences some other day. The next painting is one of the most iconic depictions of Paul's conversion. It's called Conversion on the Way to Damascus and was made by the Italian painter Caravaggio in 1601. He actually painted three different versions of this scene, but this is the one most people remember. Note that there is no crowd in this painting, just Paul and a servant and the obligatory horse. This is a very intimate and personal painting, which again may point to the artist's notions about what conversion is like. Just like Bruegel's painting, Jesus does not appear directly in this one, but look at the light. This is a hallmark of Caravaggio's work. The light illuminates everything, comes from nowhere, and yet is surrounded by a deep, almost impenetrable darkness. And notice how Paul is posed in this picture. Lying on his back, his arms are outstretched upward, not shielding himself from the light, but embracing it. His eyes are closed. His face is peaceful and serene. And his sword, the implement of his power and violence, is lying abandoned next to him on the ground. Caravaggio himself was no stranger to violence. Listen to this description of the artist by one of his contemporaries who said about Caravaggio that after a fortnight's work, he will swagger about for a month or two with a sword at his side and a servant following him from one ball court to the next, ever ready to engage in a fight or an argument so that it is most awkward to get along with him. In 1606, Caravaggio killed a man in a fight and had to flee his country. When I look at this painting and that abandoned sword and that peaceful expression on his face, I can't help but wonder if this painting is a cry for help, for the kind of peace and release from violence that Jesus offers in converting us away from the life we have known. This next piece is by Flemish Baroque painter Peter Paul Rubens, The Conversion of St. Paul, completed sometime in the 1620s. Rubens also painted this scene several times, and this particular work is a collaboration between Rubens and several of his students in his studio. I like the idea that art, just like music and just like worship, is something that you can do individually, but also something you can do with other people. In this painting, we're right back to the busy crowd and chaos, with Jesus radiating light from the heavens. This time, Paul's horse has fallen to the ground with him. There are several horses here, and even a few camels thrown in for good measure. The animals seem to be just as spooked by the light and the voice as all the people are, with one man in the center holding his head and writhing in agony. But what strikes me the most about this particular painting is Jesus, flanked by two sweet baby cherubs in the sky. Unlike Michelangelo's Jesus, who was thrusting that light down on Paul in anger, this Jesus 
is extending the palm of his hand downward to Paul in love, as if he desires to raise him back up again, if you will only take my hand, Paul. It reminds me that the way we see and understand Jesus profoundly affects the way we react to him when he shows up unexpectedly on our journeys. Paul, who looks utterly bewildered in this painting, had no reason to expect that kind of mercy from the man he had set himself against. Our final painting is technically not from the Renaissance. It's a pen and watercolor drawing by the romantic poet and artist William Blake called The Conversion of Saul and completed around 1800. But I just couldn't resist including it here. Like Caravaggio's painting, this piece is intimate and personal. Even though there are others depicted both above and below, they all fade into the background, leaving Paul and Jesus in the forefront. The angels are all looking away, and the soldiers, yes, they're soldiers, you can see the tips of their spears, the soldiers are for the most part bowing their heads, shrouded in the shadows. There's one upturned face in exception to that, but there's always an outlier, isn't there? Jesus and Paul are closer together than in any other piece we've looked at, so much so that you can see them looking right into each other's eyes. Oh, and in this one, the horse is down, but Paul is still mounted, which accords him a dignity and a status that the other paintings do not. There is also some wonderful symmetry and shape to this piece, with Paul's arms framing the edge of the circle of heaven. Everything above in that circle is fluid and in motion. Everything below that circle is fixed and static. But Paul himself is halfway in between both worlds. His arms are outstretched and reminiscent of the crucifixion, perhaps foreshadowing the Christ-like suffering that he will face in his own ministry. But the arms of Jesus are interesting too here. One is reaching down to Paul, like the Rubens painting, beckoning him upward. But Jesus' other arm is pointing outward into the distance, a reminder that conversion is not just a call for us to change our ways, but also a call for us to get up and go, to proclaim the gospel, the good news to all the world. This, too, is foreshadowing Paul's new road and his new mission to the Gentiles. I hope you've enjoyed this little trip through art history and our scripture story. All of the images that we've talked about today are posted on our church website in case you'd like some time to look at them a little bit more closely. I want to leave you with this thought today. While not everyone is gifted with the skill or talent of a master painter, all of us carry in our hearts and our minds these images and understandings of our sacred stories. And they are just as varied, just as diverse, and just as beautiful as we are. The way we see Jesus, the way we understand Jesus, has profound implications for how we share Jesus with other people. But that is exactly what Jesus calls us and inspires us to do. May all of your art, all of your music, your dancing, your singing, your writing, your craftsmanship, whatever it is that you do, may all of that be a living testimony to the one who meets us on the road, the one who knocks us down when we need it and lifts us right back up again, the one who gives us new purpose, new hope, and his unfailing love. Thanks be to God. Let us now say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.